Hello there and welcome to today's Education Week webinar, Your Questions on the Science of Reading Answered. Uh, we are gonna start off today with some housekeeping items and then we'll get into introductions so you can meet the rock star panel that I have assembled for you all here today. Uh, as you get logged in, now is a good time to review some of the technical aspects of our presentation. Please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume if you're having any trouble hearing me right now. If you're still having issues, there is a detailed audio troubleshooting file in the resource list that's under that Q&A window you'll see on your council. If at any time something freezes or you hear music, you don't see us, just give the browser a refresh and we'll be right back on your screen after that. Uh, there are some other icons that open additional features in the panel today. You'll be able to read about our speakers in the speaker bio window. Uh, you can click the resource list to download a copy of today's slides or other resources we've curated for you on this very important topic. You'll see a group chat if you want to chat with us as we're uh, sharing thoughts today, reiterate something that's resonating with you. Please don't hesitate to use that. We're really excited to have you all here today. Uh, as we're going through the webinar today, be sure to talk about this on Twitter. You can use the hashtag EWWebinar and don't forget to tag at OTISK12, today's sponsor. Uh, this is a roundtable discussion, so we welcome your questions. We want to hear them. Uh, please type those in the Q&A, not the chat, so that we have those all queued up for the dedicated time at the end of our session today. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free to download version of the slides are going to be accessible through edweek.org using the exact same login you use today. So to answer the question again, that's probably gonna come in. Yes, this is being recorded. You will be able to pass it along to a colleague, have them register and check out uh, this session to catch up on everything that we'll be diving into. Okay. That covers the technical pieces for today's webinar. We'll go ahead and start with some introductions and then jump right into our roundtable. Uh, my name is Kendall Hunter. I'm the product marketing manager at Otis. I will be moderating today's webinar where we will discuss your most pressing questions about the science of reading. Uh, I am a former reading specialist and, read and special education teacher, excuse me. So Reading education is something that I know I'm very passionate about, just like our other panelists today. And there's a lot to unpack when it comes to the science of reading and early literacy. So that's exactly what we're gonna be doing for the next 57 minutes or hour webinar today. Uh, if you've yet to hear of Otis, who is sponsoring today's webinar, we are a K-12 student data and assessment solution. And we're really thrilled to bring together a panel of four school leaders who have extensive experience, as you'll hear shortly, uh, in the areas of early literacy, reading instruction, and even policy implementation. Uh, in the webinar council, you will see some slides that showcase how Otis can support early literacy initiatives in your community through things like early identification, universal screening, ongoing assessment, uh, the use of evidence-based reading curriculum, which we'll definitely hear about today, uh, and most importantly, those individual reading plans that so that really every student gets the support they need to be successful. While we won't be focusing on Otis during this session, you might hear it come up, uh, but we have some visuals in the council available for you should you want to peruse those. So definitely check that out. But without further ado, I wanna introduce our webinar panelists for today. They are the experts that you're gonna be hearing from as we really dive into uh, the topics for our webinar. So, some of the topics that you'll hear us discussing as we get going here is really just unpacking the science of reading. We'll talk about why this has become a buzzword. I know my inbox is inundated with subject headlines saying the science of reading. We'll dig into why this is coming up now. Uh, we'll talk about recent legislation and really what the trickle down effect of laws and policies on the science of reading mean for schools and educators. And finally, we'll touch on responsive literacy plans that really meet the needs of all students. So we'll be moving through those topics in a discussion format uh, with our panelists. So first up today that I wanna introduce, we have Dr. Mary Beth Kaderna. Uh, Dr. Kaderna is an independent consultant and retired curriculum director uh, from Wooddale School District, which is in Illinois. Uh, Dr. Kaderna has served as a principal, assistant principal, 
instructional coach, reading specialist, classroom teacher, with the majority of her time as a classroom teacher uh, in the classroom as a kindergarten and first grade teacher. Uh, recently, Dr. Kaderna has been consulting with school districts on topics like MTSS or multi-tiered systems of support, effective leadership, mentoring, standards-based grading, curriculum development, dual language, uh, instructional coaching, and reading. So definitely bringing a wealth of experience to the panel. Next, we have Jenny Kirkbride. Jenny is the Director of Student Data Systems at Alamosa School District in Colorado. So we are thrilled to have Jenny here with us. Jenny supports teachers and administrators with tools to help them use student data in ways that'll meet their goals. Uh, she recently shifted to the role, to the role that she's in now, uh, which is supporting the data system needs of school districts, really after decades of managing the production of web-based world language curriculum and assessments for adults. We are so excited to have Jenny with us. Uh, next up, we have Christine Collins. Christine is an interventionist for River Trials School District 26 in Mount Prospect, which is also in Illinois, so similar to Mary Beth. Uh, Christine has served as a classroom teacher, assistant principal, principal instructional coach and interventionist for over 24 years in education. Christine is also a certified reading specialist with an administrative certificate and has mainly worked in Title I schools uh, with diverse student populations and many uh, multilingual needs. So welcome, Christine. We're excited to have her expertise. And last but absolutely certainly not least, we have Natalie Brightup. Natalie is an intervention specialist and reading coach with the Barksdale Reading Institute and has also served as a first and third grade teacher. Uh, Natalie's experience is unique in that she's worked for the Mississippi Department of Education as an interventionist, literacy coach, and regional digital learning coordinator. Natalie is currently employed with Kids First Education and does a lot of work in that role uh, with MTSS, so similar to Dr. Kaderna with the multi-seared systems of support, uh, works as an ELA coach and then project coordinator and head coach. So as you can tell, our panel is truly a group of rock star school leaders and educators with a variety of experience to lend to the conversation from their roles in the classroom to now in leadership positions, as well as working as consultants to help really schools across the country unpack topics like the science of reading. They are ready to share your knowledge, their knowledge with all of you today. So thank you for being here uh, with us. So uh, we are gonna jump right into our round table discussion for today. And as we do that, I just wanna point out that we have that Q&A that I mentioned. We did receive over 70 pre-submitted questions so we'll be using those really as a guide to get started because this is your questions on the science of reading answers. So we'll be using those, but please feel free to participate through that. And we have dedicated time at the end. So the science of reading, before we jump into really unpacking this, I wanted to start off with a quick overview of really what our audience needs to know about the science of reading. Uh, maybe some common language to set the stage for our conversation. And I'm gonna have Dr. Kaderna start us off with that. Uh, would you mind just sharing a quick overview for us of the science of reading? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's so thank you so much for coming on. This is an important discussion. Uh, reading is near and dear to my heart. I've spent most of my career in studying um, how to teach. I started out as a kindergarten first grade teacher, and I wanted to know what are the best ways to teach my students how to be a reader. Never did I think I would go into administration or leadership in this capacity. But the science of reading provides a great foundation for evidence-based instructional approaches that are really informed by research. And it's a focus on understanding reading development. And for those of you that have multilingual learners and dual language learners, it's important to have an understanding of how those learners learn how to read um, as well, what is their reading development? How do they develop as readers? That could be the same, but it is different as well. Um, for me, I don't feel all the concepts in the science of reading are brand new, um, but it does give us new research. And I think we need to be open to new research that comes into the field and the research will continue to evolve. In the younger years, it is extremely important now, and it has been, an, important for my 35 years that I've been in education to teach foundational skills. Um, you really need to have a solid foundation of 
phonological awareness when you're teaching the younger students, but also you don't want to forget about all the other areas of reading, oracy, word recognition, fluency, um, comprehension, and writing. I mean, that's why we, we teach all of those things so, so that students can comprehend text and to be a good reader and writer. Um, teaching reading is complex. Um, and not all learners learn in the same way. And so we have to have a toolbox um, as educators to dip into to meet the needs of all learners. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. And to that end, I just wanna end with, it's my personal opinion that reading, we have to infuse, it has to be fun and kids need to love reading and we can skill and drill them to death but they also have to love it and want to come to the table and understand the real purpose of what reading is, that we want to tap into their interests and making meaningful and something that students really want to do. Thank you so much for setting the stage there. I think what you shared is just so powerful. It's recent research, but we also still have to focus on those foundational skills and really igniting that love of reading for students throughout the way so that they can be engaged and develop that comprehension. And yeah, this this webinar is adding to your toolkit, right? All, all teaching is, is just expanding on that toolkit, continuing to consume new content and staying up to date. And we can do that through these conversations. So I appreciate you setting the stage there. And we'll definitely dip more into those students with diverse backgrounds and really ensuring that the research and what we implement is, um, you know, considers every student and their needs. So thank you for touching on that. Natalie, I'm going to toss it to you, and I'm wondering if first, if you have anything to add to what Dr. Kaderna shared, but then I'm also wondering if you could just elaborate for us on why are we seeing such a heightened interest in reading at this time? Well, I would like to kind of touch on what Mary Beth said first and, and about knowing knowing the, the research and the evidence behind the science of reading and I was reading something that Natalie Wexler put out and she she called it, you know, Frankenstein's monster because we have all of this research and then we have other reading theories or programs that have been done in the past that weren't necessarily grounded in evidence. We're starting to see, unfortunately, some areas where people are piecemealing um, some programs or some theories or some evidence or research, you know, practices that aren't necessarily truly grounded in the science of reading. So to kind of just reiterate, it is important for us to go back to the basics, go back to that research that's been done for, like Mary Beth said, 20 years. You know, unfortunately, it's just now kind of getting the spotlight, but it's been around for a long time. So going back to that research and making sure we're, we're truly following um, what works for children to learn to read. As far as national concerns, um, I think that, you know, we, we all are aware that there has been a literacy crisis and and unfortunately in some areas we're still we're still struggling with that and so i think just having a, a, an awareness of the struggles that students are seeing academically um, the reading difficulties that we're seeing in schools and classrooms unfortunately in our country um, have really been brought to the forefront and our politicians thankfully are leaning into that research that cognitive science that neuroscience and even looking into best practices that we want to see implemented in our classrooms. And so starting even from a political standpoint, then putting out laws and, and things like that have, have really helped in our country in certain states that are really leaning into the science of reading, but also understanding that reading is a fundamental part of academic success and lifelong learning. You know, we have these kids in our four walls for K-12, but reality is we want them to be successful beyond 12th grade, right? So the things that we do within our four walls at this moment in time with them are very important to their success later on in life. And so think and knowing that reading is fundamental in that. And then also keeping up, like Mary Beth said, with the ever-changing research that's happening and how we, we learn how kids are processing from paper to brain and brain back to paper. So I think that's one reason why it's been a, um, such a big hot topic in, in the nation and I hope it continues that way. 
what you shared was just so powerful. I, it reminded me of a quote that I've seen is, is that, you know, we're all reading teachers, right? We have to prepare students for the future and reading is, as you said, fundamental. So, you know, we're not just a science teacher or just a math teacher. We are all teaching reading in some capacity. So I saw there were many roles represented on our registration, which excites me because I think because of the national spotlight, more people are saying, hey, what do I need to know about this? How does this impact me? How can I best support students? And, you know, it's maybe an old uh, thought, but it's, you know, it's no longer the job of just the reading teacher to teach reading. We all should be invested in the reading success of our students. Uh, thinking about kind of the trickle down effect, I know Natalie touched on why this is coming up more, why, you know, the illiteracy crisis and some of the policies, I would love to hear um, from Chris and Jenny more at the district level, what sorts of conversations about reading science legislation or just reading in general are happening in your own school communities, uh, being really boots on the ground there? Chris, did you want to start us off? Sure, thank you. Um, in my district that I'm currently working in, the focus is kind of like, what are we seeing in students? Where are they? Um, and we really have been digging into that data and what it's showing us and then relating that to our tier one instruction. So thinking about our um, curriculum materials that we have right now, is that meeting the needs of our students in terms of developing their reading skills? So what are the pieces that we might need to Frankenstein together while we have you know, a program that is more focused on guided reading and balanced literacy where we know we need to strengthen the foundational skills for our earliest readers. So, um, you know, we have added a systematic phonics program um, K through three. We have been working with teachers to increase their knowledge and understanding of what are those evidence-based practices in their classrooms. Um, and we're, you know, starting to think about, okay, when we come to the next adoption, um, what does that mean in terms of adopting materials and training teachers um, so that, you know, all of these teachers who've gone through reading programs that focused on a more balanced literacy approach versus um, evidence-based practices, how can we support the teachers in implementing in their classroom and on a day-to-day, -day, you know, hitting the ground with this? I'm glad to hear you touch on the professional learning piece. We're definitely going to dig into that more, but I saw a lot of conversations or pre-questions submitted just around what does that look like, those conversations around the shift and the need for professional learning. And then similar to what we do for our students, right, establishing a staff baseline. Like, where are we at now? Where do we want to grow as a staff? And what do we need to equip our team with? Uh, to get there. So thank you so much for sharing on that. I'm going to hand it off to Jenny to share more about some of the conversations that uh, you're seeing in your district. I know Chris is in Illinois. Jenny is joining us from Colorado. So curious if there's similarities, differences, or what sorts of conversations you're hearing. Sure. And um, my role is a little bit different uh, in the district. So I hear sort of a different side of those same conversations. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I'm hearing about are, you know, looking at interventions and uh, sort of the logistical uh, piece of how do we make these interventions happen uh, in the classroom? How do we leverage our existing data to help those digital interventions be more effective. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, also the logistics of, well, how do we, how do we comply with legislation? Uh, we do have legislation here in Colorado related to uh, the science of reading. And uh, so there are a lot of com conversations about uh, the logistical side as well as sort of the, the professional uh, development and curriculum side. Um, just how do we actually make this happen without, you know, adding an inordinate amount of time um, to do these things on top of everybody's already overloaded plates? Um, so those are the conversations that that we're having in our district, um, and and I've been hearing here in Colorado. Thank you so much for sharing more on that, and I'm excited about the unique perspective that you bring because there is that other end of things and it's that systems, that data, that implementation piece that's just so important to kind of making the vision a reality in terms of actually tracking. Um, you know, we conceptually, of course, can do as much research as we want in the science of reading, work to understand it, but then it, the larger discussion is what, what do we do next? Um, so thank you for bringing that to the forefront. 
Uh, I know we have educators and school leaders really from across the country here with us today, which is so exciting. Uh, but what sometimes confuses me is that the legislation does look a little bit different in every state. Certainly there are trends, themes, common words, or common words that are just swapped out for different words, but kind of mean the same thing. Uh, as of January 2024, 37 states, including the District of Columbia, have passed uh, laws or implemented new policies. So that's huge, related to evidence-based reading instruction, something we've kind of heard touched on here today. So with that in mind, we're not going to dig too, too deep into policy, but I do want to talk about how members of the panel are responding to recent legislation that's an, aimed at enhancing early lit literacy initiatives, and then maybe some successes or challenges that you've encountered. Uh, so no matter where you are in your journey with science of reading, I think it's helpful to just kind of know what states are doing. Uh, and I'm going to actually toss it to Natalie first. Natalie, I know you work very closely with Mississippi schools. Um, and in the last few years, you shared with me ahead of time that the state took some really focused steps. I think many others are just following suit now. Um, but what can you tell us about your experience working with some of the early literacy initiatives in Mississippi? Yes, and I'm proud to say that Mississippi often fall, falls last on a lot of lists. But in this circumstance, we were first um, in 2013 leaders of our state saw that we obviously were suffering through a literacy crisis and we have a lot of work to do still um, but in 2013 they started the literacy based promotion act um, which in a sense was an early intervention so for our k3 classrooms we were able to use universal screeners and diagnostics and and all of the data in order to determine reading difficulties that our students in K-3 were having and to address those needs right out of the gate. Um, because we know if they're not reading on grade level by third grade, um, the chances of them catching up are very slim. So we really were kind of groundbreaking um, in our nation in that, that we said, we have a problem, here's our solution to it. And through that Literacy-Based Promotion Act and that early intervention, um, there was obviously an emphasis on literacy instruction. Our State Department, um, companies like my own, Kids First, we go in and we, we deploy into these school districts and we support teachers by building knowledge and capacity through professional learning, boots on the ground coaching. Um, and through that, we've seen a lot of success and a lot of capacity building within our schools where that wasn't necessarily the case before. Um, we even have a third grade reading assessment that is a is a pass or fail um, and we have some policies and procedures in place to support students who may not pass the test um, as far as retaking the test and, and differentiation and scaffolded supports um, we even have something called a good cause exemption for students who ha have possibly retained more than once who have received intensive interventions um, all of that to say that it is really pushed our state, it has pushed our teachers, administrators, everybody from the top down to really have a focus on literacy instruction. And we've seen great gains in our state. I'm very proud of it. Um, I know we will continue to do great things as the research comes out. Um, as far as the challenges are concerned, resources are always an issue. Um, you know, most of our state is considered rural when we think about Mississippi in terms of, of our nation. Um, our State Department, as well as the federal government, obviously has allocated monies to things like resources, professional learning and whatnot, but sometimes we need more, right? Um, as far as teacher preparation, I know colleges and universities have really started to lean into the science of reading, thank goodness. So it's not so much training on the job, you know? Um, so that's been nice through programs like letters and things like that, that they're getting at the college level. And of course, always having conversations around equity and access, um, even to things as simple as broadband in our schools. So um, again, proud of our state, proud of the leaps that we've made, and I'm excited to see what we'll do in the future. I love to hear that you're seeing success uh, as a result of that hard work laying, 
you know, laying the groundwork there for students and what they need. And I've saw so many questions come in ahead of time around those teacher prep programs, because the reality is, as you said, that on the job training, in addition to all of the other skills that new teachers are learning when they enter the classroom is so important. So I love hearing that you're seeing um, some universities and colleges and teacher prep programs really working to educate future teachers and leaders on these uh, fundamentals and some of the research. Uh, Dr. Kaderna, I know you shared uh, the comprehensive, the Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan with me, and we added that into the related content section. So if your state doesn't have any current legislation and you want to look at Illinois, that might be a great resource, but can you help us uh, unpack a bit um, what our audience needs to know about literacy in Illinois and that plan and what you're kind of seeing in conversations? So in my 25 years, I've been in Illinois, 35 in education, it's probably one of the best documents I've seen the state board come out with. Um, it really is a companion document to the state standards. In Illinois, we're locally controlled districts. So the information that's in the new Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan, which is adopted by the state board in January, are recommendations, they are not mandates but they are great recommendations in the fact that um, they don't, it, it has kept, and I noticed someone in, I was reading the chat, how do we keep not pol you know, poli politicize um, the science of reading and all this? They really kept all of that debate out of it. And they talked about what is evidence-based core instruction, what is not evidence-based. And they did not come out with any, you must use this particular program because they honor the fact that in your community and in your lo local school district, we all are different. We have different types of learners, but there are evidence-based practices that are you know, valid and not valid based on research. So we are able to pick, and I will say, and those of you who are maybe publishers out there might not like this, but people stamp any and everything on, like I'm sure there are already materials stamped with the new Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan on them that that's covered. And so we know as educators by using data, what works and what doesn't work with kids and for particular um, learners. But it, there are three areas that it touches upon. It touches upon um, student instruction. There are se the seven components of literacy are part of the plan and it gives recommendations for pre-K through 12 learners. It talks about professional development. The only thing that's mandated in the plan um, actually, or in the law comes for higher ed. They must prepare teachers to come into the field knowing those evidence-based practices and then we take it from there when they get into the field. Um, and then on um, the state board to come out with materials that are going to support districts in teaching um, the Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan and um, that will help us support learners. So um, I'm very, I feel very positive about what is being done in Illinois. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm, I'm curious, knowing that Chris is also uh, an Illinois educator, Chris, are you hearing any discussions around some of those evidence-based practices that are in the plan? What are you hearing uh, at the local level as far as the conversations or implementation of anything in the plan, or is it more of a discovery period right now to uh, learn the plan before implementation next year? I, I think it's very much, um, we are in the discovery and learn kind of <laughs> part of the plan right now. Um, it is pretty new. I recently attended a webinar given by the um, State Board of Ed to just kind of going through and explaining the plan. And I loved the, I, I mean, they kept the words science of reading out of the plan specifically to avoid making it political or like those heated art you know, discussions that can come when we try and, you know, pit one side against the other. It's more about serving the students. So, um, I think right now our school, you know, we we have what we have right now, and it's how how can we move forward to make what we are doing better, um, while keeping the things that are working. So that's that's where we are right now, um, and it's still, you know, again we still have teachers who um, were trained a different way, and so we have to kind of work where you know start where we are, just like we do with students um, as we're moving forward. I think that's huge. And as we heard from Natalie, their plan was developed back in 2013. So, you know, there is no overnight fix. There's no Band-Aid. We need to slowly assess, 
plan and be intentional in the same way that we would with our students. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, Jenny, what about in Colorado? I know um, there is some legislation. I think we've talked a little bit about the Colorado READ Act. What has the implementation of that looked like for your district? Uh, sure, <clears throat> and I'll just talk uh, a little bit about sort of generally in Colorado, what that legislation looks like. It's very similar to uh, what's ha what happened in Mississippi and around the same time frame as well. Um, so it has been in place here in Colorado for, uh, you know, <clears throat> for around a decade. Um, there have been some recent changes to that, uh, or not, not changes, but recent updates to require some training uh, for teachers, uh, K-3 teachers around the science of reading. Um, <clears throat> and the components of that sound somewhat similar to what what's hap has happened in Mississippi, where um, you know we have these assessments, um, uh, interim uh, assessments, where we're screening for uh, what Colorado calls significant reading deficiencies, um, and if a student is identified with a, a significant reading deficiency, then they have to have a read plan, uh, which uh, specifies interventions that will be provided for that student to um, to bring them up to grade level. Um, and then those students, once on a read plan, they continue on that read plan until they are demonstrating grade level proficiency. Um, <clears throat> also, similarly to Mississippi, it does focus sort of on those K-3 grades. Um, but the read plan, if a student is not reading at grade level by grade three, then that plan will continue with that student um, until that student is reading at grade level. Um, and so what that looks like for our district, um, you know, I'll, I'll mention a few of the things that we do. Um, we, uh, we use Dibbles eighth um, as our reading screener that's implemented, that the students are assessed three times a year. Um, <clears throat> that data uh, is used to determine whether this, a student is on a significant reading, uh, has a reading deficiency or not. Um, and if they do, we have the plan. We do use Otis. Um, Otis is helpful in a couple of different ways. Um, or It serves as both the home for our plan, but also as uh, our, our data warehouse. So we're able to uh, have all of that data together. Um, we're able to filter uh, use filters to identify those students who need those read plans. Uh, from my experience, teachers, they generally know that, but sometimes the administrators, they want to be able to filter and see and just make sure that no one is falling through the cracks. Um, <clears throat> the other aspect are those plans um, and getting the data for those students uh, readily and quickly into the teacher's hands. Um, so our plans, they pull in all of the students' most recent data, not just from, from Dibbles, but all of the related uh, assessments as well, whether that's NWEA or our state, um, uh, state tests. Uh, all of that data right there in the plan so that the teachers can um, evaluate, is this student making progress on their plan? Are they not making progress? Do we need to adjust the interventions, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what I will say, you know, uh, for those states who maybe the legislation is more recent, um, you know, you'll still be working out kinks. Uh, even a decade in, we're still working out kinks. Um, so, you know, just, just face it and work through it. I love that advice. We really have to pivot, right? It's our job as educators and definitely appreciate the Otis shout out there. Um, if you want more information on some of those reading plans, we are working with schools really across the country um, to help them develop responsive data driven plans that really support students and their needs. And I think the biggest component of that is being able to scale your efforts so you can work smarter, not harder. As an administrator, there could be a lot of students who need additional support based on screeners and assessments and you need an easy way to look and see okay what are we doing 
How often are we checking in on it? And what does their progress look like so that we can go back to the table and have those conversations again? So those plans, uh, well, they can be used for a multitude of things like MTSS or just progress monitoring in general. It's a really great fit for uh, some of those students who may have individual needs that you need to track. So definitely putting in a plug for that. And thank you so much for sharing, Jenny, about your experiences using those plans and having that data really uh, drive what, it, what supports are in place. I want to shift gears a little bit here uh, and talk about responsive literacy instruction. Uh, when we look at the science of reading, much of the research has been centered around students who speak English as a first language. Uh, we received many questions ahead of this uh, on this ahead of time. I've seen some questions in the uh, Q&A already about English language learners, so we are going to talk about it. I'm just wondering for the panel. Uh, what their thoughts are on if there's any limitations of a general education curriculum that's really rooted in the science of reading for those dual language students or students who do, do not speak English as a first language. And then if there are, what should we do about it? You know, what provisions should be made within early childhood programs to really make sure that we are addressing language and cultural needs effectively? And I am going to toss it to Dr. Kaderna first because I heard her mention this uh, right during her intro. Dr. Kaderner, what are your thoughts on uh, this topic? Well, you see the big smile on my face because one of the things in the Illinois plan, and I spent uh, a bulk of my career working with second language learners and dual language in communities with um, very diverse learners. Um, and I really feel like when you're dealing with, we call them multilingual learners now in Illinois, they keep changing the term, and dual language, they need more time. They just need more time. They're developing two languages. They're learning how to read and write in both languages. Um, they need more time to practice their skills, especially oracy. Oracy is important for the monolingual classrooms, but it's extremely important for um, dual learners and multilingual learners. And just building vocabulary and background, um, that's really going to aid in reading and writing development for those learners. Um, they also need explicit instruction in vocabulary, grammar, and language structures in both languages to enhance their comprehension and um, their production of the language. Instructional practices and curriculum, when you're building that, it also must include time to bridge the two languages so that you're working in both languages. And, and bridging um, refers to the process of when you're helping students um, make connections between their first language and their second language. So that's really important when you're, when you're building in and you're working on curriculum. Um, and so forth. And they're, they're learning how to transfer those strategies and techniques um, and their knowledge and their skills and their supports for the understanding in both languages. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with bridging, there's a lot of great books out there that you can, um, and a lot of uh, professional development and there are Facebook groups that you can um, join that will help you with that. But um, I do think that it's important because a lot of times when we develop policies, we if we're not in those diverse communities and we don't have a lot of second language learners, we have a tendency to just focus on what is good for monolingual students. And what is good for monolingual students is not always the best for your multilingual learners and your dual learners. Just like in a monolingual classroom, those students learn differently and you have to use data and you're, you're targeting, you have to have a strong tier one, but you have to have things like our dual classrooms and our monoclinical classrooms have the same curriculum, but they use different resources and there were different strategies for those learners. Some the same, but some being different. So you have to really pay uh, important attention to that. And I think, that that's one thing that I really feel like that I could say to people is get out and advocate. Advocate to your legislators. That's what we did in Illinois. We gave a lot of feedback. There were people that um, were out there advocating for equitable education for all students, students that have difficulty learning how to read, advanced learners, and then our second language learners and our dual learners. That's really important because many times they don't understand that if they're not if they're not bilingual 
or they didn't learn learn they didn't learn how to read and write in another language. Thank you so much for starting this important discussion. I want to toss it back to Jenny. Jenny, has your team found the need to put any additional supports or could, had discussions around considerations in your own community for students who don't speak English as a first language? Yes, this is something that does come up in our district. And um, to be honest, it is an area where I think we're still evolving and still uh, improving. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, we have, <clears throat> we do have newcomers um, in our district and kind of have throughout time, although there are some great influxes now uh, within Colorado. Um, but we've been starting to engage in discussions uh, about doing some diagnostics, especially when our students are coming in, not necessarily at those, those very early, um, early grade levels, when they're coming in at, you know, second, third, fourth, et cetera, um, doing some, some assessments to try to understand maybe what their comprehension is in their uh, home language. Uh, <clears throat> whether they, what their reading proficiency level is there and what we can build on from that language proficiency versus, you know, if they have a low language proficiency in their home language, then um, our strategies and our interventions may uh, differ a little bit. So those are the, some of the conversations that we're having uh, here in our district. So important, assessing students in their native language. So I love hearing um, you share that and just that that's part of one of your practices. Uh, Chris, what are you seeing in your role as a reading specialist? Um, well, I I think what has been said already, um, you know, you have to come in with the, um, you can't underestimate your ML learners, right? They bring their own background and knowledge um, to, our, you know, to our schools and communities. We can't assume what they know or what they don't know. So we need to um, take time and figure that out. Um, there's often um, a lot of connections between their first language and English. So as they're learning, making those connections is really important, like um, Mary Beth said. And then um, one of the most powerful strategies that was in the prior district I worked in, um, we we're trained in GLAD strategies, which is guided language acquisition design. So basically the whole premise of that is to use every opportunity in your classroom as a chance to build language, whether it's oral language, written language, or spoken language, or you know comprehension as you're reading. So every content area, every um, was integrated with language objectives. And I think that if you are, as you are, you know, planning um, all the areas that you are instructing through the day, if you're always having that at the back of your mind, how am I building language um, for all of my students, including MLs? Um, I think that that gives us a lot broader opportunity to make sure that they are gaining, making the gains that they need to. And um, that's going to lead, you know, those are those evidence-based strategies for multilingual learners are good for all learners, right? So um, the building vocabulary, the integrating experiences, um, the chances to speak and talk um, with a partner, the scaffolding of those, um, of those skills will help all of our learners as they're learning. Um, so that's kind of the conversations that I've seen. I love that you shouted out a strategy. It's great when we're on these webinars and people can kind of take something away from that that they maybe want to look up or bring back to the classroom. So I want to call out the GLAD strategy. And I completely agree, right? Language is not taught in isolation. So it's that approach. And that's something that you can really just weave in and use or keep in the back of your head as you're designing your lesson. So thank you so much for sharing uh, a tangible takeaway for um, educators who may be wanting to take something from this right away back to their class and kind of approach with their lesson planning. Uh, Natalie, I want to make sure we don't forget to hear your perspective on this. I'm sure you still have some more thoughts to share. Um, any considerations or in your work consulting, any conversations that have really stood out to you as valuable on addressing the needs of students who don't speak English as a first language for our dual language students? Absolutely. Um, our, our work with Kids First, you know, has allowed us to not only work in Mississippi, but other states surrounding um, 
and we're seeing a, a, an increasing need um, to educate teachers on how to best approach multilingual learners um, because that's not going to change. Um, it's it's probably going to continue to grow, and so we've we've got to again help build their capacity. And through our company, we believe in um, you know looking at data and creating a plan alongside our stakeholders, whether that be the district level or administrators or teachers. And through that plan that we create, um, we commit to it and we commit to it based on the data. And until the data says for us to change, um, we continue with that plan. We continue um, differentiating instruction to make sure that we're meeting the needs and the learning styles and the strengths of those um, students. Like someone said before, we look at where they're, they're uh, strengths are and we lean into that to fill those gaps in learning. Um, we also teach them how to explicitly teach and how to implement scaffolds and repeat that process until necessary with those students. Um, also looking into multi-sensory approaches through kinesthetic, auditory, and visual learning. And I am a big proponent of graphic organizers. Um, anyone that walked into my classroom, it looks like the United Nations with all of my organizers hanging around. I think that's a great visual um, piece for multilingual learners to make those connections with what they already know and then um, what they're trying to learn in English, as well as teaching educators how to collaborate and teamwork with one another. Nothing is more powerful than two adults that are on the same page, whether it be an EL teacher or a special education teacher working together to meet the needs of all of the learners in their classrooms. That was extremely powerful. I completely agree. Uh, it's like that collective teacher efficacy, right? We can do more when we do it together and we commit to our students and we know that that works. So that is just so powerful. And I also am a graphic organizer queen. So that really resonated with me. I'm not even in the classroom anymore and you'll just see me using a graphic organizer for anything. There's something about that that just helps structure my brain. I know it works for students too, so I, I love that strategy. Um, I can't believe we are nearing the last 15 minutes of our webinar here. I am gonna start to sprinkle in more of our questions that have come in uh, as we've been chatting here today, and we have a couple other topics to touch on. It's amazing how fast time flies when you're talking about reading and supporting students. So thank you so much for all the engagement throughout. You all have been sprinkling in questions for us and sharing thoughts, and I just really appreciate it. Um, but I do want to address this. This one came in a few times. Uh, just kind of continuing to build on the need to address diverse learners. Uh, thank you to Anna Lucas, uh, Dr. Andres Duran. These individuals who are asking these questions are wondering how the science of reading should be modified to support students with IEPs, 504 plans, developmental delays. So going beyond, you know, we just talked about multilingual students, but how do we adapt something like the science of reading to meet the needs of our diverse populations further? Uh, Chris, can I toss it to you first for this one? How, any suggestions for supporting students with IEPs when kind of looking through that science of reading framework? Um, absolutely. I, I think that what we all know as teachers is that our data should inform our decisions. And I think that goes double or triple for students with IEPs and 504s. We need to know very well, like what are the needs of the particular students that we're working with and then even more than you do in tier one or two, two, um, you want to design their instruction to specifically match those needs. And so their instruction is going to need to be, you know, very structured, very explicit, um, continually monitored using, you know, on that instruction needs to be monitored so that we know, you know, are they making progress and, and moving towards their goals? Um, but, you know, that's important for all of our students, but especially for IEP students and 504 students. I also say that um, special education teachers and, um, need just as much uh, training or even more so than tier one teachers. They need to make sure that they know and understand how to present structured literacy lessons. Um, they need the, the best materials that are most aligned with evidence-based practices. And um, I feel like I've been in places where special education teachers 
are sort of the last considered um, in terms of getting materials and resources. So they need to have the tools at the ready so that they can deliver that really specific and targeted instruction. Um, they need the tools to assess and d dive into the data um, so that they can provide those you know, specialized um, program moments for their students. So I think that, you know, and that to me is what special education is about anyway. It's not really any different than, um, you know, I, I don't think science of reading brings a, a different understanding to that. That's to me what it should be. And I think that kind of we could learn from special education to a tier one, right? Like how, how can we use that data to um, specifically address, you know, our students and that that to me is what is um, essential for our IEP and 504 students. Thank you so much for sharing that. It brings me back to my days co-teaching when as a special ed teacher, I would share a strategy with the general education teacher and they'd be like, we should be doing that all the time, right? It's a strategy that benefits all students, but it's that explicit direct um, nature of it that maybe isn't covered as much in those content area classes, but is just truly so powerful. What we do for those groups of students, we should do for all students to really ensure everyone's getting what they need. And there's certainly benefit to that. So I, I definitely appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Dr. Kaderna, anything to add on supporting students with IEPs or uh, 504 plans when thinking about some of the research on the science of reading? Ditto, ditto. You know what uh, <laughs> Chris said. I was sitting, I was like shaking my head up and down. I just think that we really need to focus in on the data and really looking at the data and having data sources that you trust and ways to display the data quickly, efficiently. I know that you don't have, um, there were days when I had spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet or papers all over my desk. And I was like, okay, I need a way to organize this. And teachers need a way to make decisions very quickly and on the spot um, so that, and, and visually to display that um, visually. I think quantitative data is important, but so is qualitative data. So really taking anecdotal notes, asking the kids, talking to the kids, talking to the families, wrap around those kids and find out what, what are their needs, what interests them. Because these kids that have been struggling have been struggling for years. We start failing them in like fourth and fifth grade and we, you know, we get, we need to really find out what are their interests, build relationships with them. It's not rocket science. So I think using all of those concepts, but really building them up and giving them small wins as well um, is really important. Thank you so much for sharing on that. I know we've talked a bit about early readers, diverse leaders. We have had this question come up a bit and it's a very good one. What about our middle school students who are multiple grade levels behind their peers? Uh, thank you to Danielle Torrey and M. Anderson, two of our participants who asked this. Uh, Jenny, I'm curious in your work and since you all kind of have a plan in place for supporting students with early literacy plans, are you seeing any middle school students who are still um, enrolled in plans or how are you supporting those students who might still be behind their peers after that third grade mark? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do, we do still have uh, students who are uh, below grade level uh, by the time they hit middle school. Um, and uh, this, also is an area where I do think we're, we're still improving. Um, we do uh, have, uh, so within our middle school context, uh, we've got you know, their, their core um, English class, um, but then for these students, they have a second period of the day where um, they have more intervention for uh, language, um, it, it, reading, comprehension, um, <clears throat> so that's something that we are doing is they have that second period where they're focusing on that. Um, they no longer take the Dibbles 8, so tracking does become a little bit more uh, complicated um, because they don't have that equivalent measure once they hit middle school. Um, so that's something that we're working on that piece, tracking, making sure that we're sort of graduating students off of their plans when they, they hit that grade level proficiency. 
Um, <clears throat> another thing that we do, uh, not so much on the, the reading side, but uh, we do, we have a writing uh, practice. Um, and this is not my area of expertise, um, but uh, what we have trained everybody in the middle school on it, um, not just our, uh, our English teachers, but our math teachers, our science teachers, our social studies teachers, everybody knows uh, this framework and they use this framework with all of their assignments, all of their assignments that involve writing uh, all across all grade levels of the middle school. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we're doing to target those, um, those skills within middle school. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And I have to say, Jenny, you have the best growth mindset. I am guessing it just must be, you know, proficient in your school community, but you've just been so honest and candid with us about here we are now, here's where we want to go. And I just think that's so great to model. So thank you for sharing with us where you're at. And yeah, we're all reading and writing teachers, right? So I love that you all have embraced that and equipped your team to support that um, rather than just saying we're all reading and writing teachers, teach the math teachers, teach the science teachers how to do that. So. Thank you for sharing that protocol that you all have used there. Uh, I'm going to, I want to toss it to Natalie to see if you have anything to add on those middle school students. And then I want to wrap up with talking about the family engagement piece of this because we haven't dug into it too much, but I want to make sure we touch on how folks on our call here are engaging families as partners in this process. Uh, but Natalie, what are your thoughts on the middle school students and supporting them? And if you've had any experience on this in your work with schools uh, consulting? Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we do um, sometimes visit middle school and high school classrooms. And, and as we listen to students read, um, we hear, you know, them laboring through that process. And um, so for us as a state and then as a company at Kids First, um, outside of just Mississippi, we're going into schools, not only elementary, you know, our elementary schools have, have had a 20 year head start on on mtss and and supporting through tier two and tier three instruction um so we're able to go into these schools especially junior and high school um, classrooms and kind of build that capacity for those teachers um, we say to them yes we understand that they have to maybe take a state test or they have to understand these certain standards you know by end of year what's that evidence of knowledge for them but the reality is, is that they're struggling to read the words on the page. And if they can't do that, we know through the simple view of reading, you know, their reading comprehension will be at zero. So going back and, and building that capacity, because many of them at the secondary level didn't have those foundational classes that those of us are in the elementary realm were blessed to have. Um, so teaching them that advanced word study on, on the morphology of words and and how to teach kids how to break down those words in order to decode them and then look around those words for meaning. Um, so that's part of what we do um, at Kids First as we go in and do that, as well as help restructure their tier two and tier three to support those junior high and high school students. Um, I know in our state alone, in Mississippi at least, they have credit recovery classes. They even put students into what they call reading strategies classes um, to like to what Christine said, to support students who are struggling with those language comprehension skills. So it's been um, an uphill battle. Um, again, those elementary schools have had a head start, um, but they're coming around, they're seeing the benefit and they're seeing the growth and the data for those students that they're, they're supporting at tier two and tier three. I think that's excellent guidance too for others who may be experiencing this is bringing in an expert, you know, experts like yourself to support those teachers with those uh, challenges that they may be facing with students because it might be a little bit of uncharted territory. I know I've certainly worked with teachers and heard like, I'm not a reading teacher, I'm a this teacher, they should know how to do this, but if they don't, we have to do something. And as others have said, you have to let the data guide that and then work backwards to support that. So thank you for sharing some of that work. Uh, I do want to wrap up by talking just a bit about family engagement and really what it looks like as families are partners in the process of reading. Uh, Chris, what are you all doing to engage family in some of these reading discussions in your district? Um, I, so I feel like um, just as our teachers need to learn and our students, you know, we're trying to um, 
find the best strategies to work with our students. We also need to kind of educate families in sort of like the shift, the shifts that we're making. Um, so I think like one of the biggest things that um, has come up has been sort of the shift away from like a weekly spelling list to um, more like we are word studying, we are focusing on patterns. So, you know, that's gonna look a little bit different. Um, we are sh shifting more towards decodable text for our youngest readers. So, you know, that looks a little bit different than some of the prior things that may have been sent home. Um, I think we take opportunities at our open house to, you know, showcase our curriculum and the tools that we're using in the classroom. Um, we do have, um, every year we have a reading night at our school to kind of um, have families participate and learn about activities that they can do with their students. Um, and I think that uh, our grade level teams, our grade level teams are very specific about what they put in their newsletters um, and how they're sharing um, information about what's going on in the classroom, but then also the data that we are gathering on the students, right? We benchmark our students um, three times a year with AmesWeb and twice a year with MAP. And then we have opportunities for parents to receive that information um, and you know have teachers talk through it with them so that they understand like what we're seeing and what that means in terms of student instruction um, and then for our students in intervention we communicate on a regular basis sort of like where we're seeing the needs for those students what the extra support is going to look like and what they can do to help at home too you said it best, what, what we need professional development on, families need professional development on too. So just even establishing that baseline expectation of like, we're continuously learning, so are they. I love that you you know brought to the forefront some of the ways you all are doing that. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our webinar here. I wish we could continue talking about this topic. I know I could for hours, but I will let you all go back to your days. I just wanna thank our fantastic audience for all of the engagement in the chat, all of the questions that were coming in. We just really appreciate your participation, you being here and working to expand your knowledge of this topic through the lens of what these school leaders have experienced. And thank you to them for taking time out of their days of stepping away from their students to share with you all what they're doing and what's working. And like we said before, having that growth mindset, what are our areas of opportunity? Because the power of us all coming together and discussing those topics is really where we can make a difference. So thank you again for being here with us today. If you were curious to learn more about Otis, I know we talked just a little bit about some of those individual reading plans. We'd love to continue the conversation and uh, chat more about what your early literacy goals are, what you're working on in reading education and show you how we can support. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out. We are at otis.com, but thank you so much for being here. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their school year. And again, big shout out uh, to all of our panelists for their time today. You'll get this as a recording, so you can always catch up and review that there. But thank you again, everyone.